Okay, I'll call to order the Green Bear Board's hearing of June 19th, 2024. We have three agenda items today. Uh, there's the fiscal year 25 Medicare only budget guidance staff presentation and a potential vote noticed. There's a potential vote also noticed on one cares fiscal year 25 risk mitigation plan. And then lastly, we have uh, state level recommendations to support hospital transformation, which is part of the board's um, act 167 work. And we have our staff today. And additionally, we have Dr. Bruce Hamry who is a partner and chief medical officer at Oliver Wyman, who's been retained to provide uh, recommendations and options for the state to create a sustainable and affordable healthcare system. Um, so we have no meeting minutes or executive director report today. So we'll go straight to Michelle Sawyer, our health policy project director for the Medicare only budget guidance. Wonderful, thank you, Chair Foster. I'm going to try presenting a different way than previously. Can everybody see my slides? Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Okay, great. We are here today to look at the Medicare only ACO budget guidance for FY 2025. Um, and we'll also take a look at some, the status of um, some budget order conditions for 2023 and 2024. So the agenda, I'll, I'll do a few introductory kind of slides, including public comment, a timeline um, of this process, and then um, the staff process for the development of this guidance. And then we'll dive into the guidance itself. We'll go section by section and talk about the changes. Um, and then we'll go into Lore Health, um, their FY23 budget order condition status updates. And then for FY24, we'll look at both Lore Health and Vitalize Health 9, those budget order condition status updates. Um, and then we'll summarize what we discussed, time for additional discussion, and then a potential vote. So first, public comment. We had a special public comment period open for a draft of this guidance um, through noon today. And um, at this point, no public comment has been received. Um, here's the timeline for um, the budget guidance uh, and, and the kickoff of the budget process, really. So this guidance uh, needs to be issued by July 1st. So we have um, a little bit of a buffer this time around, which is always welcome. Um, the budget submissions are all due October 1st, and then the board will vote on all ACO budgets by December 31st. So this slide is to visualize the process of continuous improvement that the GMCB staff implement when developing guidance documents. So at the top left, we see a cloud. Um, administrative burden represents a variety of things. Um, it might look like uh, confusion on behalf of the ACOs, um, back and forth between their staff and our staff trying to clarify different things. Um, it might look like collection or production of unnecessary information, um, and then any of those sorts of downstream effects. Um, and then the umbrella represents continuous improvement. And it's really in place to shield not only just the, the guidance documents, but the whole budget process from that undue administrative burden. So the three steps undertaken by the, the GMCB staff are as followed. Uh, follows. The um, first, the staff reflected on the FY24 budget process for Medicare only ACOs. That's our process analysis. The few areas where um, opportunities for improvement resulted in a new web page project on the GMCB site for new ACOs, um, where interested parties can learn more about how the Green Mountain Care Board regulates ACOs. Um, on that web page, there are associated timelines and sample documents. Um, we also updated the spring financial reporting template to be clearer and more ACO agnostic. Uh, and the corresponding appendices in this year's guidance was also updated to align with that template update. 
Second, um, we worked to align statute to the guidance. We cross-referenced our guidance with Rule 5.403 and 18 VSA 9382. And this is a process that we do each year, but this year we really took a special interest uh, to explore whether or not a new set of guidance materials might need to be developed in the case of a Medicare-only ACO with more than 10,000 lives in Vermont might enter the landscape. Um, while at this point we don't anticipate an ACO with this large a footprint to enter uh, Vermont for FY25, it is good to know that this guidance will fit that need in the future if necessary. And third, stakeholder engagement. As always, we shared guidance document drafts with relevant stakeholders, including the Office of the Healthcare Advocate for feedback. Um, we feel as though this is always a valuable part of our continuous improvement efforts by contributing to an increased transparency and collaboration. So into different sections of the guidance itself. Um, in the guidance instructions, very little changed uh, other than to add some additional information about the submission of confidential information and how to request confidentiality. GMCB staff have recently created a new web page, which I mentioned, um, which is linked in the guidance itself and in the PDF version of this presentation um, to assist ACOs with this process. So section one of the guidance, um, there were no changes made from the FY24 version, um, but just as a review, this section of the guidance collects basic identifying information from the ACO, um, tells us about consumer input activities, complaint and appeal processes, uh, notice of any pending legal actions, and any reports from professional review organizations or payers. Section two, um, again, there were no changes from FY24. Um, the summary, but this section does give us a summary of the ACO's provider network here in Vermont. Um, it lets us know which other states the ACO is operating in. Um, the percentage of the ACO's attributed lives in Vermont, that's always helpful context um, for, you know, the, the um, how much uh, the presence of the ACO in the Vermont might really weigh with the ACO's um, overall operations, if it's just a small percentage of their attributed lives versus, you know, a more significant chunk of their lives are here in Vermont. Um, we ask about um, provider turnover uh, within the ACO network and then any uh, plans for the ACO to expand their provider network specifically within our state. Section three, um, we did remove the request for a description of their attribution methodology. We found this to be duplicative because the attribution methodology is pretty clearly uh, outlined, um, whether they are a Medicare shared savings program ACO or an ACO reach, we do have access to that information. Um, and but this this section does collect any sort of quality reports segmented for Vermont if it's available, depending on um, how long the ACO has been um, operational. So we request those reports here. Um, we request copies of existing agreements with Medicare. Um, determination of the ACO's savings and losses, it, again, if the timeline allows for that sort of information to be available. And then um, the ACO proposed benchmark capitation payment, savings and losses, and any other financial program tied to the quality of care. So section four, this collects the actual financial um, uh, information from the ACO. We did add a question to this section. Um, does the ACO have any, have any executive leadership compensation structure that is tied to reducing the amount paid for patient care? Um, we also, as I mentioned earlier, the financial sheets were cleaned up um, to be more ACO agnostic. Um, so this section also requests the most recent audited financial statements of the ACO and publicly available financial reports, um, asks for a description of how funds flow between payer, ACO, provider, and patients, um, and the ACO's financial liability, and um, through those appendices, the current and budget year financials. 
For section five, we look at the ACO's model of care and community integration. We did add a question asking for the ACO to describe their quality evaluation and improvement program. In this section, we learn about the ACO's model of care, um, their efforts to expand capacity in primary care practices, health equity, and their priorities around um, pushing that forward, performance measurement over time, referral programs, and uh, if they benchmark themselves against, uh, benchmark their, their performance against other ACOs. And then finally, section six um, is um, the APM agreement scale target sheets, um, which we have had all ACOs in Vermont fill out each year. We did not make any changes for FY24, and it's really, we use these to determine whether or not an ACO um, aligns with scale qualifying uh, targets. So that wraps up the review of the guidance. Um, so let's, I thought this would be a good time to just review with the board the status of some of the budget order conditions from years past, because um, some of these conditions won't be fulfilled until later this year um, because of just data delays and that sort of thing. So condition one for FY23, again, this is for lower health. Um, we had asked them to submit their FY23 shared savings and losses segmented for Vermont. Um, and we anticipate that these, uh, these um, shared savings and losses figures will be submitted as part of their FY25 budget. Um, and so condition number two was an updated financial summary, which they did submit back in 2023. So we're all set there. The next one we want to focus on is number three. Um, we had asked that their MSSP quality reporting segmented for Vermont, if possible, to be submitted as well. And again, due to timing, it's not available until later this year. So we do anticipate seeing that um, this fall. And then other two conditions um, are have been resolved. They've been fully met. So for FY24, this um, covers both conditions for Lore Health and Vitalize Health 9, which is the other Medicare ACO um, operating in Vermont at this time. So again, the first one is for FY24, shared savings and losses um, segmented for Vermont. So we don't anticipate to see those until next year. Um, number two has been uh, submitted as ordered in April by both ACOs. And again, number three, we've asked for quality reporting um, for their applicable uh, ACO um, programs. And those, again, will be submitted in 2025. Um, number four was a subset of, of quality metrics that we had requested that ACOs submit um, after three performance years in Vermont. So for lore, after 2026, we should see that information, and that would be af in after 2027 for Vitalize. Um, and then the other thing that we can uh, expect this fall, as, as far as reporting goes, is number five, um, a semi-annual update regarding operations in Vermont and consumer complaints. Um, for LORE, they had two due this year, um, and the first has been um, submitted as, as required, and the second will be submitted um, at the same time their budget is submitted, and Vitalize will submit their first along with their FY25 budget as well. And then that blueprint, blueprint for health orientation, both ACOs did undergo that orientation. So, Summary of all of this, the FY25 budget guidance, there were minor improvements. Um, we just confirmed the kind of generalized applicability among all Medicare only ACOs, regardless of size um, and different types. Uh, and then we reviewed the FY23 and 24 budget order conditions. Both ACOs are currently in compliance with all ordered conditions um, and staff will continue to monitor any outstanding conditions at this time. I will turn it back to you, Chair Foster, for any discussion. 
Thank you. Um, I have no comments other than appreciation for your work on this, um, Ms. Sawyer, and I'll open it up to the others. I don't have any comments either. I appreciate all the hard work and um, thank you. Yeah. Same. All right. Tom and Dave are nodding as well. And so we'll move to um, the healthcare advocate for any questions or comments. And um, is there a 17th slide, Ms. Sawyer? Just um, sample motion language. And Mr. So, Chair, this is Susan Barrett. I apologize. I got an email from the healthcare advocate and they are not able to be here today. And I forgot to tell you, so my apologies. Right, of course, Ju Juneteenth, right. <clears throat> um, okay, so I'll go ahead and read the motion and then take public comment, see if there's a second and take public comment. Um, I move to approve the Medicare only ACO fiscal year 25 budget guides presented today by Green Mountain Care Board staff. Is there a second? A second. And is there any public comment via the raise the hand function? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And the motion's unanimously approved. Thank you very much, Ms. Sawyer. And we have Medicare only budget guidance. Um, the next agenda topic was uh, is the One Care Vermont Fiscal Year 25 mis Risk Mitigation Plan, which will be presented um, by Mark Hengstler, our staff attorney, and perhaps Ms. Sawyer as well, but I'll turn it to Mark. Really good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to pull up a deck here. Um, it's like five slides, so you're not going to hear a lot from me, but I'm going to just walk through what we're doing today. Uh, we're looking at the One Care FY25 risk mitigation plan. I'm going to explain just under the rule what what uh, we're looking at and what is getting voted on, and give a high level overview of what One Care presented to the board on the 12th. I think that was last Wednesday. So, starting point this year is a little bit different as I understand it from years prior. So rule point uh, uh, 5.403B, uh, in it, it says that if an ACO is planning to bear risk in the next budget year, the board has to establish a risk cap as part of the budget. And in establishing a risk cap, the board looks to a number of factors, including uh, item two, which is highlighted, which is the ACO's risk mitigation plan. The risk mitigation mitigation plan describes how the ACO would cover losses it would incur under the risk cap, whatever that risk cap ends up uh, getting set as. So, my understanding is that years prior, One Care has submitted with its budget both its proposed risk cap and its risk mitigation plan. This year, they asked to do things a little bit differently. Uh, they asked to come to the board early propose a risk mitigation plan for FY25 ahead of the FY25 budget process, their plan being then to come back for the budget process and the board would deal with the risk cap uh, side of this then. And that is fine un under the rule. Um, it, it is a little bit different, uh, but procedurally, just to, to explain all this means is that if the board chooses to vote on the risk mitigation plan now, one care gets that decision now, and then when the board moves ahead and does budget review later in the year with one care, the risk mitigation plan and any findings that the board makes in regard to the risk mitigation plan simply can get incorporated into the the budget order for FY twenty um, five. So that's a a bit of an overview of of what we're looking at. With that in mind, uh, we did have a public comment period for I think a week. Didn't get any responses. The uh, the presentation that OneCare gave last week, and I don't believe elicited any any public comment. 
the presentation at a high level overview last week hit on really, I think, two ideas. The first idea that One Care presented last week was that it is it, it it's designed to connect desired health outcomes with financial outcomes for participating organizations. One Care said that it was not conceived to shield provider organizations from financial accountability for healthcare outcomes, and it therefore proposed a continuation of its current delegated risk model whereby shared savings and losses are allocated to the provider network and one care with that in mind is authorized to offer exceptions to the model in the spirit of sustaining provider participation i believe one care gave an example of nvrh which has a slightly uh, uh, uh different uh uh model i think they could speak to that if the board had any questions about that so that was that's the the design that one care was proposing a continuation of this delegated risk model and with that in mind what it what it's proposing for fy25 which i understand to be status quo is the concept that it would maintain a risk reserve of 10% of the total program risk estimate a liquidity reserve, 45 days of operation cash. The Medicare contract requires a financial guarantee of 1% of TCOC, and OneCare explained that it fulfills that obligation through a line of credit. OneCare last week also explained a little bit about its contracting with uh, participants. It provides prospective risk estimates in April of the preceding performance year, and then contracts with uh, participants uh, through addendum to to set ma maximum risk levels and um, to set uh, the uh, uh, yeah yeah just, just to set the risk levels. So that's the that's what One Care is proposing uh, for for its risk mitigation plan for FY25. The motion language I'll I'll turn to now for the board is uh, relatively. Uh, straightforward, but the idea here is that um, if the board wants to take up this motion uh, and and approve, it could uh, allow One Care to implement this this plan as presented last week, with the requirement that One Care receive approval from the board prior to making any change to this plan or prior to implementing any risk strategy inconsistent with the plan. Like for example, if it wanted to change some part of its uh, risk policy at its own board level, it would need to go to, to the GMCB to, to get permission to do that if that was inconsistent with, with what's presented here. So high level, um, I, uh, I'll i turn it back to you, Chair Foster, but uh, happy to answer any, any questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Um, board member comments, questions. Okay, I will make the motion and see if there's a second. Um, I support the motion. I watched the video and the read the plan, and uh, I'm prepared to move that one care shall submit. Sorry, one care shall implement the risk mitigation plan as presented on June twelfth, twenty twenty four. One care must request and receive approval from the GMCB prior to changing this plan and prior to implementing a risk strategy inconsistent with this plan. Second. And is there any public comment? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion carries. Um, thank you very much. The last agenda item today is uh, part of our Act 167 work, which, as people will recall, came about um, in summer of 22, uh, where there's a couple of different components, one component being um, retention and work with uh, an expert on health systems transformation. And it involved a pretty deep level analysis of both data and um, meetings and interviews with communities to understand how we can revitalize and sustain our healthcare systems here in Vermont. Um, originally back in 2018 ish, 
maybe it's 2019, I think 2018, there were hospital sustainability plan efforts. And then we went to Act 167 in summer 2022. And now that work is uh, largely completed. And at this juncture, Dr. Hamry will be able to present um, some of his statewide findings. So there's a component of statewide options and recommendations for things that the state can change to make our health system work more effectively. And then there will also be hospital specific recommendations uh, for how particular hospitals can change to ensure sustainability and to revitalize access to care that's needed in the various local communities. So I'll turn it over to Ms. Baraby and Ms. Melamed um, to take it away. Good afternoon, Chair Foster. First, um, because we're a little ahead on the agenda, I just want to check that um, Dr. Hamry is online. I, I see him, but that he's ready to go. I am. Thank you. Are you online, Bruce? Okay, great. And then Marissa, I will this begin. is Susan. Mm -hmm. um, again, sorry to interrupt, but I'm trying to get our AHS colleagues um, gathered because they wanted to, we've invited them to come and participate and I know I do see some folks from AHS but um, I would I'm, I'm trying to get them here they I think they were planning on attending at two so um, I don't know chair Foster if if we just proceed I know we're going to have some intros and then Dr. Hamry will go with his recommendations so hopefully they can get the message and pop on We're, we're more efficient, efficient than we could have predicted. Why don't we? Um, I, I, I don't want to have them miss, so I apologize. Right. I don't want to take a break either, but I think it's important that they be here. So Absolutely. why don't we take a, why don't we take a twenty-minute break till one fifty, and that way, Dr. Hammery and the team can take ten minutes to introduce the topic, and at worst, they miss the short intro. But maybe we can get it coordinated by then. So we will take a break until one fifty p.m. and I. Apologize for the break. All right, so we'll resume our hearing of um, June 19th and we'll turn it to Ms. Melamed and Ms. Barabi uh, for their presentation on hospitals, or sorry, Vermont state system wide transformation. Great, thank you, Chair Foster. Okay, are you able to see the slides? Not yet. Okay, hang on just a second. Not for kitties. Mm -hmm. But for people too. Ah, oh, they're not showing up still. No. Hang on just a minute. It's a technical issue. Mm. Oh, geez, I have to pull them back up again. Okay, let's try this again. Still not working? No. All right, um, I can try one other way or Kristen, if you have them, not sure what's going on with my teams. I'm ready if you want me to present them for you. Okay. Yeah, the issue is they're showing up on my screen, so I have to try to get that to go away. Um, something is stuck. Oh, 
Okay, I got <laughs> fixed it on my end, Kristen. If you want to, if you want to put it up, we'll proceed that way, so you don't have to watch me uh, try a different way. Sorry about that. Is that showing up? Uh, it is for yes. me. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon to the board, uh, members of the public. My name is Marissa Melamed. Uh, Deputy Director of Health Systems Policy, and I serve as Project Director for the Act 167 Community Engagement Work. <clears throat> uh, I'm pleased to be joined today by my colleague Elena Barabee and Dr. Bruce Hamery of the Oliver Wyman Health and Life Sciences Practice. Uh, Bruce might be familiar to many of you already because he's been in dozens of meetings with healthcare providers, organizations that serve Vermonters, and the general community since last summer. Um, he also has several years of experience on other projects in Vermont, including the Health Services Wait Time Report, and he was the person behind the COVID data modeling produced for the administration um, with the Department of Verm uh, Financial Regulation during the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Elena and I will begin today with a brief history and why hospital system transformation is necessary to preserve Vermonters access to essential services. Then we'll pass it to Dr. Hamery to provide for you an update on where we are in the community engagement process, what the next steps are, including an invitation to attend and participate in community meetings facilitated by Bruce and his team that are happening in person in all 14 hospital regions in Vermont over the month of July. You can go to the next slide. Um, okay, sorry if, if there's a delay here, but it looks like looks like we've moved. Okay, um, so Elena and I will review um, what is Act 167, Hospital System Transformation. Uh, for community engagement. Why is hospital system transformation necessary to ensure Vermonters access to essential healthcare services? And why was this work initiated in the first place? Uh, then how will we move forward and what are the next steps? So next slide, and then you can actually skip to the uh, slide with the boxes. So people have probably seen this slide before, but just to orient everyone, um, the legislation, um, Act 167 of 2022, sections one and two has several different parts um, that the Green Mountain Care Board is working on um, in collaboration with the Agency of Human Services or that are led by the Agency of um, Human Services. They include the subsequent all-payer model agreement, hospital global budget development, um, and development of value-based payment models. Um, as well as the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, hospital budget review process um, evolution. And that fourth bucket there, the community engagement to support hospital transformation um, is, is the focus of uh, our work today and our work with uh, Oliver Wyman and, and Bruce. Uh, so you can go to the next slide. So this is the statewide community engagement project timeline. We're moving into the final phase of the project. As the heart of this project is engagement, the analysis feedback synthesis has been and continues to be an iterative process with feedback continuously flowing between the Oliver Wyman team and engagement partners. Uh, ongoing conversations with hospital, community providers and organizations and advocates are helping to inform options and recommendations for transformation. Bruce will speak to this further, but there is no one size fits all solution. Options and recommendations are not static and are dependent on current initiatives, community needs, demography, geography, et cetera. Um, once the community conversations are complete in August, Bruce and his team will submit final findings uh, to the Green Mountain Care Board. You can go to the next slide. So this is a snapshot of the breadth of the engagement uh, that was completed as part of round one in the fall. Um, the results of this project will be the culmination of over eight months of collecting input from approximately 1,800 Vermonters through public community and provider meetings, outreach to over 100 community organizations, visits to each hospital in Vermont, over 93 public comments received and reviewed, and analysis of healthcare data from multiple sources. Uh, these figures are from the first round of community meetings held virtually in October through November, 
Uh, they do not include the engagement meetings that are underway in phase two and that have happened since um, since that time. And um, they will, you know, all of this work will culminate with the community meetings this summer. Uh, our outreach team at Green Mountain Care Board has started to deploy an extensive outreach plan and many of you logged into this meeting today um, probably should already have received an email with materials to help promote the second round of meetings, including a social media kit, frequently asked questions, um, and a poster. Uh, please reach out to me if you have any questions about um, meeting promotion or these materials. Next slide, please. So in that first round, community members and providers reported challenges and bright spots within these key themes during the first round of meetings. Uh, access to essential health services, cost of healthcare in Vermont, diverse populations, and health equity. Uh, Dr. Hamery reviewed these themes in a previous presentation to the board on January 17th, uh, which is linked on the slide for reference. And the next slide, please. So you can go, you can go to the next slide. Why is hospital system transformation necessary? So hospital system transformation is necessary to simultaneously address two key problems. One, hospitals' financial health, particularly for rural hospitals, is poor and continuing to deteriorate. And two, increasing commercial prices to sustain hospitals is no longer a viable option given the affordability crisis. I'm going to pass the um, presentation over to Elena, who's going to take you through some of the data to illustrate these issues. Great, thank you. Okay, so next slide. Um, so as we all know, it's a, a slide that should be familiar to you. I think we bring it up every couple months over the last several years, um, but the numbers keep growing. So rural hospitals have been struggling um, across the US. There have been 192 closures since 2005, 149 of those since 2010. So it's um, only been ramping up in more recent years. You know, there was some relief during COVID funding um, that helped sustain many hospitals, but I think we're right back um, kind of on the same trajectory that we were headed in the first place. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, and this is, again, not a new conversation. We, The board has been witnessing declining hospital margins for a number of years. Um, in 2019, I think this came to a head and um, with the Vermont uh, Springfield Hospital um, when they filed for bankruptcy. This was a significant concern um, of the board and of legislators and, and residents and, and many people across the state. Um, and it wasn't just Springfield. Um, these declining margins are, are really um, occurring system-wide, if you go to the next slide. Um, so, you know, this is updated with our FY23 actual data. And what you can see is that the, the number of hospitals experiencing negative operating margins has really only grown. Um, as I mentioned in 2020 and 2021, you can see we kind of start to look a little better. And then again, in 22 and 23, we're really dipping back into the red. Um, so a lot of that COVID funding dried up and expenses and inflation continue to increase. Um, and now nine of our 14 hospitals um, have ended with negative operating margins. Um, and I just, you know, I think this is a really important consideration when, when moving forward. Okay, the next slide. Um, and this is also kind of having a devastating effect on our day's cash on hand. Um, so we've seen a significant decline from 2017 to 2022, again, with the exception of that years around COVID funding, when we had a little more cash in our system to help people go keep going. Um, and this is only kind of getting worse um, over time, particularly for smaller hospitals that have less flexibility. Okay. Um, at the same time, we're spending more and more and more on healthcare. Um, so a couple of decades ago, so in 1990, we were one of the lowest deciles in terms of spending per capita um, when you compare Vermont to other states over the last um 20 and 30 years, this has really increased. And now we're kind of consistently among the top spenders in terms of per capita spending on healthcare. Um, and I, you know, even compared to some of our New England peers, we're we're kind of we're all up there, but we're we're among the highest. So we go to the next slide. 
Um, and the majority of the spending um, flows through our hospital system. So in Vermont, we actually spend almost 50% of hospital spending is for hospital care. Um, you know, and this is pretty significant. So this is, of course, continues to be a focus when we're thinking about affordability um, and how we're spending our healthcare dollars in Vermont. That's why hospitals tend to be the, the center of attention there. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, and as I mentioned, this, this high level of spending has really had a profound impact on affordability of health care in our state. Um, this is looking at an annual premium for a family of four. Um, this is Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and you can see that the premiums have been increasing, but also the out-of-pocket maximums have been increasing. This is looking at 2018 to 2024 um, across um, many of our plans. Um, and this is really concerning. Um, and this isn't just... Um, in kind of one area, if you go to our next slide. So we see this in our marketplace. You can see that Vermont is um, the highest among New England states in terms of the premium for our average low cost silver plans. Um, and that has increased significantly in recent years. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this is just showing kind of the same market. This is really, you know, 80% um, increase, cumulative increase from 2019 to 2024 for MVP and 64.6% um, in the individual market for Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, and the next slide, we'll talk about the employer market. Sorry, we can skip this one. And the employer market, um, this is also kind of this growth, this high level of um, affordability concerns and kind of the growth over time, particularly in more recent years, um, is a real concern. Um, and you can see, so the, the top line here is the total annual premium. The second series of lines is the employer contribution, contribution and the bottom line is the employee contribution. Um, so what you can see is that, you know, the employee contribution has been generally Ladder, um, but you can kind of see Vermont is now eclipsing in terms of the employer contributions. So our employers are contributing more than um, kind of their U.S. the U.S. average. But you know, I think there's probably only so long this can continue before it um, it keep kind of transfers to our to our employees as well. And um, many employers are having to choose between kind of being able to offer health plans at all um, or kind of downgrade the value of their health plans. So these are, are real um, decisions that are affecting the care and the coverage that Vermonters are getting. Let's get the next slide. Um, and so as we mentioned, you know, hospitals and kind of circling back, you know, hospital um, financial health is a concern. Um, hospital spending is, is large and, um, you know, thinking about kind of controlling hospital spending or kind of improving hospital financial health, there's really um, only so many levers that you can kind of pursue. So um, you can increase commercial prices, which we know some of our prices are among the highest. So it's not really a great option, particularly when this gets transferred to our commercial market. Um, as we just saw, there's really not much room to keep growing in our commercial market without making it even more unaffordable than it already is. Um, reduce operating costs. Um, hospitals have been asked to kind of reduce their operating costs and think about efficiencies. Um, and so kind of there are limited returns at some point to cutting operations on an individual level. Um, increasing volume of services. There are certainly some areas that we lack access. Um, some of that would require further investment to increase access, and some of it is about what kind of access and what kinds of services do you want. So not all the services that we lack access for are the same services that um, that pay or that are profitable and that would actually help fix this situation. Um, and then or hospitals can request financial relief um, from the state or perhaps donors um, if they're lucky enough to have donors that can help um, pay those bills. Um, so there are, you know, either you can have one time money that that can, you know, kind of keep you afloat um, or you can look for increased Medicaid payments on an ongoing basis. But these can have you know, certainly implications for the state's budget and taxpayers. Um, so money's got to come from somewhere. Um, all right, next slide. Um, so I think the reason why we kind of started this work in the first place and the legislature asked us to look into this is because they recognize the limited capacity of hospitals to solve this on their own. Um, you know, it really requires kind of a system-wide approach and kind of looking across not just hospitals, but the other 
parts of our care system that maybe could be bolstered to relieve pressure from hospitals um, and why we see so much hospital spending, but also to think about, um, you know, how do we make sure that the hospital system we have is a strong one and is there, you know, delivering essential services that should be delivered in the hospital setting. Okay, so we can go to the next slide. This is a, a brief um, review of kind of where we came from. Um, so in 2019, as I mentioned, I think some of the, there was a lot of concern around um, kind of rural hospital trends and the bankrupt, Springfield's bankruptcy and, and margins. Um, so the Green Mountain Care Board convened the Rural Health Services Task Force um, in accordance with Act 26. Um, and the board at the same time, um, around the same time, required six of Vermont's 14 hospitals to develop sustainability plans. Um, we didn't see much kind of change from that, um, I would say, on a, on a system-wide level. Um, and there was kind of continued concern, particularly after the pandemic and um, kind of seeing what what happened to hospitals when when they, you know, they no longer had a revenue source. Um, so the legislature packed Act, uh, passed one Act 159, um, requiring Green Mountain Care Board to provide recommendations to improve hospital sustainability. We came back um, and, and proposed a series of recommendations, which I'll remind folks um, on the next slide, kind of what was included in there. But um, out of that came um, the legislature's work on Act 167 in response to those recommendations, really recognizing the need for a system-wide transformation um, and including the community engagement component and collecting information directly from Vermonters to help inform what um, transformation could look like to make healthcare more affordable um, and maintain and expand access and high quality care. And so um, I think Marissa talked a little bit about what that work entails, and you'll hear more in, in a moment. Um, we can go to the, the next slide. Um, so just, you know, to remind folks, the Green Mount Cure Board issued recommendations um, in response to, you know, leading up to Act 167 um, to design and implement hospital global payments to um, to, in, to bring in a health systems optimization expert to facilitate the community engaged redesign of our hospital care system to reduce inefficiencies, lower costs and improve health outcomes and to provide resources necessary for hospitals and communities to transform Vermont's delivery system. Um, in addition, the Green Mountain Care Board recognized that primary care, mental health um, and kind of Medicaid payments were essential that we really needed to. It's not just about hospital sustainability, as I mentioned before, it's about making sure we can also take the pressure off of hospitals to serve patients that could be better served in their community or in other lower cost, higher quality settings. Um, so pass it back to Marissa. Great, thanks, Selena. I'm gonna uh, wrap things up for us and then turn it over to Bruce. Um, just finally, how will we move forward? What are the next steps? You can go to the next slide. Uh, so in 2023, Act 51 was passed, um, which uh, directed the Agency of Human Services to lead implementation of a hospital transformation. Um, so that is taking, I'm not gonna read all these words here, but um, that the transformation planning shall be informed by the data and analysis and the community engagement process um, in this phase. And then um, that work uh, will be passed to, the, to human services um, in, in, in partnership with the Green Mountain Care Board to move forward on transformation. Uh, and you can go to the next slide. Uh, so up, upcoming dates. So where we are now, uh, June 19th uh, is the overview by Bruce on the state level recommendations. Um, he will be back in front of the Green Mountain Care Board on Monday, July 8th, uh, which is shortly, well, really the day before the community conversations start happening to give an overview of um, uh, hospital service area or regional recommendations. And then the community meetings kick off on July 9th um, and extend through the final meeting, which is currently scheduled for August 5th, which is a, which is a statewide virtual meeting. Uh, and then once those conversations wrap up, um, Bruce will bring his uh, final report to the Green Mountain Care Board, um, likely end of August or September with final recommendations. And I think that that is the last slide. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Bruce Hamery, um, who is a clinician leader and facilitator with over 50 years of experience um, in the healthcare field, 
um, leading major transformation. Um, and I'm going to give a try at, at um, sharing the slides. And if it doesn't work the first time, I'll ask Kristen for help again. Um, but my team is giving me a little bit of trouble today. Is it, you can see it. Okay, I'm going to see what happens if I full screen, which is what it didn't like last time. Okay, can you still see it? Great. Okay, and yes, Bruce, are you ready? To I begin? am. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marissa and Elena, for the introduction and the basic material. Chair Foster, members of the board, um, ladies and gentlemen. The healthcare system in Vermont, unfortunately, is badly broken. People can't get in to see their physician. When they can, they may not have reliable transportation to the appointment or a home to go to after the visit. Sometimes they have insurance but can't afford the copays, deductibles, or medications needed to access and uh, receive the care. Hospitals are the most expensive places for anyone to receive care, but in many instances, the hospital and its emergency room are serving as, quote, refuges of last resort for the unhoused, the poor, those unable to find a physician, and those with mental health, substance abuse disorder, or behavioral issues. These and many other factors result in higher costs for hospitals and providers, and therefore for increased costs for consumers, whether in insurance premiums, deductibles, or co-pays. The need for designing and implementing solutions to both the systemic and local issues underlying these problems is urgent and immediate. I cannot stress enough that doing nothing or significantly delaying decisions on ways to implement change. Somehow you hit the mute, Bruce. You. Today, my team and I will report on our recommendations uh, to the state of Vermont and its many agencies, departments, and commissions. These reports, as noted before, follow 10 months of gathering and analyzing data and reviewing previous reports from other consultants and several state commissions. We have talked with multiple state agencies and providers. Most importantly, we have heard the lived experience of Vermonters, including those with special needs and those suffering from health inequity. We have a small but experienced team. My colleague, Mrs. Elizabeth Sutherland, has led our exploration of health inequity and potential solutions. She has previously done work in Pennsylvania. Mr. Dan Shell, oh, sorry, next slide. Marissa, can we go to the next, okay. Um, Mr. Dan Schellenbarger is a partner in our health and life sciences practice and has many years of experience in reshaping the way healthcare is delivered. He serves as a set of external eyes uh, and uh, in addition to serving as a, a, an advisor. We are well supported by Ms. Irene Way, our engagement manager, and Ms. Danielle Etzel, a senior consultant in our firm. Next slide. You've seen uh, the objectives of Act 167. Uh, we have been guided in our efforts by a very engaged and helpful oversight group of both Green Mountain Care Board and Agency of Human Services staff and leaders. Next slide. You've seen this timeline uh, or a version of it. Uh, I would call your attention to the third bullet from the left, uh, March to July of 2024. We are currently in the uh, phase of meeting with the various hospitals 
uh, their leadership teams and boards to discuss uh, our data-driven findings and uh, what options might be uh, available to the hospital and the community to make healthcare delivery uh, sustainable, improve it, and reduce or constrain cost growth. I would note that one thing not listed on this uh, slide is that uh, within the uh, January to April timeframe, I personally visited every hospital in the state as well as Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. On each visit, I met with the hospital CEO, often with their leadership team and toward the hospital. I can say without exception, they are an experienced and knowledgeable group and are doing their best under very trying circumstances to provide excellent care in their communities. As I mentioned, we are now in June and are conducting individual meetings to further discuss uh, the findings and to receive the board's and, and leadership opinion on what additional options uh, they have pursued or would wish to pursue. In July, we will do in-person community meetings in each hospital service area. And as noted, our final report is due in mid-August. Next slide. This slide, believe it or not, shows a simplified diagram of the complexities affecting healthcare delivery in Vermont and elsewhere. It is detailed and time will not permit a step-by-step -step explanation. I will call your attention to several points. On the right, uh, we note that the population is aging rapidly and will fall in all areas except Chittenden County. The result of the population changes over the next uh, 10 to 15 years is that the working age population, those between ages 20 and 64 years, will decline in some cases by 20%. This decrease means that the number of people working and able to afford commercial insurance will drop and therefore the ability of hospitals to survive on ever increasing payments from commercial insurance will end. At the same time, the numbers of the elderly and advanced elderly will increase significantly and they will require more and different services than are now provided. On the extreme left, you see a few of the state drivers of some of the complexity, regulation, licensure requirements for providers, and lack of adequate housing at many levels for both Vermonters and the people who are needed to provide care and take other jobs uh, in Vermont. The green area to the right shows the effects these drivers have on the number and functioning uh, of the provider community, the nurses, mental health providers, doctors, and others who provide care. The blue area in the middle shows the impact on the hospitals and the patients they uh, care for. There are then feedback loops into the resulting issues patients and their families experience. Note that one of these results is that Vermonters are often forced to seek services out of the state. This necessity resulted in almost half a billion dollars of Medicare and commercial care leaving the state in a recent year. Next slide. The major pain points, so just click once. The major pain points are listed here. It's difficult to get appointments with primary care physicians and others. Uh, there is a long wait time to get elective procedures, uh, six to 12 months for uh, uh, eye surgery, for example. Uh, people suffer long waits to be seen in the emergency room. 
Uh, it is difficult to travel to get care. There are long waits for ambulance transport between hospitals so that people can get to the next uh, appropriate level of care. And there are significant impacts on diverse populations and on uh, being able to, to deliver equitable health uh, and equitable health care uh, to a number of communities. And in Vermont, that largest area is the rural poor population, uh, which is most often poorly served. Next slide. The easy solution uh, is the one we heard most frequently in all our listening sessions, public, provider, uh, and hospital. We need more money. Next slide, or next uh, click. But nobody has a printing press. So this will require higher taxation or higher commercial insurance rates. Uh, and or increase copays and deductibles for individual. Uh, as Elena noted, uh, none of these things are particularly uh, pleasant and several very unlikely to happen. Next click. Just click once more, Maurice, Marissa, please. Once more. Okay. So, as pointed out, the out of pocket maximum payments for deductibles, commercial premiums, medicines are already high, and Vermonters cannot afford to continue to see double digit growth in these um, elements. Higher taxation is not a viable solution, uh, as it will likely drive residents and businesses out of state and reduce the likelihood that other people and businesses will come in. As I mentioned, there is a shrinking population of people able to purchase uh, and afford commercial insurance. Additionally, the national supply of medical professionals is projected to decrease and the number of people needed, for example, in primary care alone is estimated to be 30,000 over the next 10 years. So increasing the demand for these people also increases uh, the cost. And so we're going to have to look in the near term to some other solutions while uh, the state programs that are built to address these have time to, uh, to have an effect. The rural nature of Vermont, and this is very important, uh, and its shrinking population means that in many areas, the size of population and the density of people, uh, together with the finances available, may not support having every hospital able to provide full-time uh, broad spectrum of specialties and to sustain those. We'll talk about this more. Next slide. So the imperatives to redesign healthcare are shown here. The most important are the first and last ones. The first, accept the new reality and adapt. This calls to mind the motto the Marines have, which is adapt, survive, and overcome. Everyone with whom we spoke agreed that despite the many fine things the state of Vermont and its people have done, despite the many programs in operation, there is very little access to affordable and readily available health care in the state. So not only adaption, but significant change is needed. The fifth and last bullet is also very important. Time is not your friend. As was pointed out, many hospitals are already on the edge of financial unsustainability, and they cannot be supported by the current mechanisms much longer. 
These changes will require constancy of purpose and sustained effort to reconfigure the available and additional healthcare delivery components into something that achieves the goals of improving access, improving equity, and improving quality while making the component pieces and the whole sustainable and affordable. Next slide, please. Vermont needs a set of solutions that will fulfill its pressing health care needs, but one that will look and feel much different from today's systems. The use of information technology and monitoring technology embedded in all the practices, hospitals, and other care delivery points in the state, including the many state agencies caring for Vermonters. Some efforts have begun, and we will discuss these in a few minutes. There will be the development and widespread use of alternative sites of care and mobile clinics to make care accessible to those who are homebound, lack transportation, or who, or who cannot afford to take time out of work to get needed services within normal business hours. These will include the ability of pharmacists to refill medications for longer periods, potentially kiosks where a patient or uh, a person can access an educational telehealth session or have a consultation with a physician. A differently configured emergency medicine system, EMS, is urgently needed. Not only changes in the way dispatches are made, but a regionalization of people and equipment with a tighter linkage to hospitals and other major health access points. The current EMS efforts, although consistent with the long tradition of Vermont independence and volunteerism, is outdated, and despite the heroic efforts of the volunteer women and men, is not meeting the needs of many communities or providers. First and foremost is the need for a full-time professional workforce who have consistent funding, are paid a living wage, and have a career path for advancement. Too often, these companies rely on grants, limited tax dollars, and doing Sunday barbecues to support themselves and their equipment. They are only paid for their services when they transport a patient for medical necessity. And so trips to evaluate patients in their homes or take patients from a hospital to a nursing home uh, are not paid for. Searching for my UCLA stuff because I... Uh, I'm sorry, would you go on mute? The result is that hospitals and patients cannot get timely emergent transfers from an emergency room to a larger hospital with appropriate resources. Hospitals also find it difficult to arrange transport for to discharge patients back to community hospitals, to a nursing home, or to mental health facilities. Means of transport for patients not requiring a mobile ICU must also be made available. There must be the development of regional referral centers for those services that can be provided in the communities rather than requiring everyone to go to UVM or Dartmouth for things like cardiology, neurology, dermatology, ENT, and other frequently needed services and care. To make this happen, will require planning and cooperation between all the communities and their hospitals, aided by and in cooperation with state planners and resources. These changes would permit the communities to accumulate enough, each community to accumulate enough patients in its service area with like diseases to support several practitioners in that specialty and make therefore make recruiting possible and sustainable. As a number of people have noted, it is impossible 
virtually to recruit a single specialist. Typically, one needs to recruit three or four, and that means that in order to be financially viable, you need to have enough people who require those services. So those uh, physicians can be split among hospitals or uh, could work in one location and have people uh, migrate to that place. As a final step, with many of these changes in place, the hoped for goal of population-based payments could be achieved by linking those payments to every part of the redesigned system. Practitioners, FQHCs, hospitals, nursing facilities, home health agencies, and others. These payments would be based on many metrics for access, quality of care, equity, and outcomes. Our state level, next slide, please. Our state level recommendations are summarized in a high, uh, at a high level on this slide. Every one of these groupings also addresses some significant health equity issues. Improved transportation uh, for community members to and from acute and urgent appointments and to get them out of the ED where many people spend overnight. For patients with uh, patients needing uh, appropriate means of transport between hospitals or institutions, just discuss that. Housing is a basic and extremely important uh, need. And it's needed both for uh, people who are unhoused or who are underhoused. That is, they're sleeping on the sofa of a friend or a um, family member. They're needed for special groups, assisted living, uh, people with special needs, and so forth. And very importantly, it is a basic need for recruiting people to Vermont to provide health care. It is part of the next issue, which is enlarging uh, and the workforce and improving the way that uh, health workers can deliver care. There is also administrative simplification needed uh, and potentially aligning some of the AHS agency uh, boundaries and work with some of the hospital boundaries. Uh, the AHS is engaged currently in a process to uh, make interaction between their uh, agencies more effective and to redesign the way that uh, their uh, clients are cared for. Last, there needs to be a much improved access to the appropriate level of care in the community. This will mean reconfiguring provider resources to better meet the community needs and achieve financial stability. And we'll discuss these further in the next couple slides. Next slide, please. Viewed from another perspective, the goal of affordable and equitable access to care is at the top. The underpinning for the changes needed is consistent funding, which will require some prioritization of effort and reallocation of current monies, as well as the uh, some seed money uh, to implement to begin the implementation phase. The pillars shown are a way to illustrate the major areas needing significant change to support the many other initiatives which will be required. Uh, in a minute, we'll show a timeline for some of these, and afterward, we'll note the many activities currently underway within the Agency of Human Services and other state uh, agencies, which are intended to address many of the identified needs. Workforce needs are first addressed by providing appropriate temporary and permanent housing for people new to Vermont. Note the yellow arrow or yellow star in the lower left. Many stories from providers and hospitals relate that a nurse, technician, physician, or other person 
has been recruited, hired, and has come to work in Vermont, only to leave after three months of living in a hotel and being unable to identify or afford permanent accommodation. These same issues fall heavily on the unhoused, the poor, and those with special needs. At the next level in this are needed changes in licensure regulations to permit non-Vermonters and, uh, and immigrants to Vermont to work in the health professions uh, without extensive and ep expensive repetition of their training. And we'll go back into that in a minute. The improved productivity, in quotes, of all providers will be made possible only by changing their workflows and, doc and the documentation needed, supported by better and more tailored electronic medical records, and by a sufficient and well-trained support staff who are able to take routine tasks away from the doctor and permit her to spend time with the patient and to make treatment decisions. Simplification and elimination of administrative tasks also provide more time for clinicians to do clinical things. These um, come together to allow the physician to see more patients in a day and for patients to achieve uh, visit times of 15 to 20 minutes for established patients. Transportation needs we have discussed, um, except for the important needs of the people, uh, uh, citizens, to be able to get um, to Nelly, and from. He had a hearing aid appointment. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, mute, please. Transportation needs have been discussed, except for the important needs of people to be able to get to and from urgently needed medical care, including that on evenings and weekends. Both provider and infrastructure, uh, provider infrastructure and payment changes require cooperative planning and coordination of activities between state agencies, communities, all and all providers, as well as hospital boards and leadership. The Agency of Human Services controls Medicaid funding, which already supports many activities to care for those experiencing health inequity. They will lead, as noted, the planning and implementation of the needed changes in Vermont's uh, health delivery systems. Improving and redesigning the infrastructure needed to reduce the use of hospital and emergency departments rests largely on the ability of community-based services and practitioners to provide basic services such as affordable mixed-use housing, mental health care, both pre- and post-hospitalization, uh, early substance abuse treatment, and others. Additional services for providing care in the home will need support and funding. Long-term care facilities, including those serving people with severe memory and other deficits are needed and could be based in facilities currently used for other purposes. A straightforward approach, note to the lower right and the yellow um, star, uh, a straightforward approach to affordability for mem certain members of the population is to make translation services available to those whose native language is not English. Signs in different languages need to be posted in public areas notifying people that in their own language that such services are available. The sim similar messages need to be posted in public areas and sent with healthcare bills and other communications to let people know how to apply for financial assistance, state support programs, and so forth. When I visited them, I saw no hospitals who had such signs in multiple languages. They were all in English. 
Phone trees needed to make appointments have similar issues. They're in English. Fortunately, uh, almost all the hospitals do have on their website the availability of translation services, but these need to be more widely available. Next slide. Shown here uh, is a timeline for accomplishing the most necessary tasks. There are some dependencies here. These timelines can and should be speeded up. As noted, hospitals are in current financial difficulty and our financial projections for virtually all hospitals indicate that there will be significant deteriorations in their financial status within the next three years or so. Again, delays in decision making and implementing change are in fact a decision to do little or nothing. We will discuss in a few minutes the many current efforts underway to meet some of the challenges I've mentioned. At the top of this timeline are some needed legislative actions to address uh, some of the environmental regulations and their review processes that are slowing the ability of communities to build needed housing and that of hospitals for adding new capabilities uh, to their communities. Action is also needed to enable consistent funding of the EMS changes we have discussed. Actions could be followed quickly by using currently available industries in Vermont that make modern modular homes, apartments, and other housing. Similar techniques have also been used elsewhere for erecting uh, efficient efficiently erecting hospitals and healthcare facilities. Increased funding to obtain expand capacity for outpatient and inpatient mental health long-term care and telehealth services is also needed and may require federal waivers to obtain. Enhancing and enlarging the workforce is a closely related and necessary component to increase the capacity of all these programs. This will involve re-examining and speeding up the process of granting licenses for trained professionals wanting to come to Vermont to practice their profession and extending the scope of practice so that new professionals can supplement available primary care and preventive workforce. These measures may include allowing pharmacists to provide multiple refills for 90 days of chronic non-scheduled medications for people who have been taking those medications for many years and to pay pharmacists for administering vaccines. Pharmacists currently have the authority to refill uh, an expired prescription for five days pending uh, a subsequent visit to a physician, uh, noting that those visits may take three, six, or 12 months uh, to obtain. One could envision the capability to obtain for pharmacists and others to obtain needed blood testing to monitor the impacts of certain medications on kidney or liver function. The, previous, the use of EMTs and paramedics in new roles has also been noted. Enhancing local training programs for nursing assistants, radiology technicians, and some others is already underway as hospitals and local universities collaborate. However, gaps remain in areas like laboratory technology. Programs to support medical students and residents in training to spend time in community practices and in local hospitals need to be established and supported. These would be in addition to the two recently announced family medicine programs uh, that have been um, made possible in two of the uh, community hospitals. These efforts will improve the numbers of people choosing primary care and practicing in such communities. They also improve the recruitment and retention of providers in these communities. 
appropriate housing for these people is an urgent need. Noted here also is the importance of improving the information technology and systems used to support providers and state agencies. There has been an effort underway to develop a statewide health information exchange. This effort needs significantly improved increased funding and a speeded effort. Current capabilities have not been meeting the identified needs of either providers or patients. As this is accomplished, it will also be vital to send help out to the provider practices to assist them in using their computer programs to assist and not hinder, hinder rendering care to their patients. Devices currently exist to improve the performance of charting and so forth. Some of these uh, are being tested at UVM now. Realignment of funding and various state agency operations to more closely align with redefined hospital service areas will likely be needed to improve coordination between providers, patients, and supporting agencies. These issues can be discussed uh, during the um, efforts led by the Agency of Human Services during the next phase of implementation and planning. The hospital actions are shown below. Some of these are very straightforward. Others really uh, relate to the ongoing efforts to transform. Next slide. This slide details the many actions being taken by the Agency of Human Services, the state licensing boards, as well as actions by the legislature and administration to address the issues I have noted. The actions completed are noted by check marks, and those at some phase of development are in open boxes. References giving additional information are also noted in blue and should be accessed for more detailed information. Please note especially the multiple efforts substantially underway in mental health and uh, care, elderly care support. I would call your attention to the continuing need for enhancing payments for residential care, assisted living, and home health. Some uh, increases in these, as well as Medicare, uh, Medicaid payments for dentistry uh, have been made. Further increases may be needed. The adult daycare program, although of benefit in reducing isolation, provides very little support for those elderly experiencing multiple chronic illnesses and those who are heavy utilizers of emergency department services. Alternatives exist, such as the existing SASH program or PACE, and should be expanded or uh, implemented. Streamlining and verifying uh, the uh, simplifying the process of obtaining a license to practice in Vermont has been a focus of effort and is much improved. Additional considerations have been mentioned, such as expanding the scope of practice for some groups. Another suggestion is to follow the example of Tennessee and Florida and to pass legislation permitting suitably trained and physicians in practice in their specialty in other countries to come to practice in Vermont without the need to repeat all their specialized training in the US. There are some of these doctors in Vermont. One works in a printing plant. Medical data infrastructure we have discussed. Uh, these programs need to be speeded up at least one program is early into a five-year process. That is too long. Next slide. The needs for structural reform of the Vermont healthcare system and systems cannot be overemphasized. Vermont has implemented many excellent programs, including efforts to constrain costs. However, some of these programs uh, have not provided adequate solutions and certainly uh, have not been effective 
in preventing the current state of affairs. Much of this lack of success is due to inconsistent and insufficient funding, resulting in successful pilot programs not being sustainable or widely implemented, or uh, due to problems recruiting the professionals needed to run them. And we've noted what some of those related issues are. This reform must include changing the way some healthcare services are delivered, both locally and regionally. Difficult choices among options and priorities will need to be made and pursued consistently with the involvement and support of each town and community. Expedited action is needed. There is an urgency to complete these structural uh, changes within the next three to five years. Hospital systems and the state will see deep financial deficits if no structural reform is achievable within that period. Next slide. This reiterates the uh, next steps. Uh, we will complete our hospital specific meetings next week present our findings and provider system recommendations to the board on July 8th, and that will be followed immediately by in-person community meetings in each of the hospital service areas, plus some additional statewide meetings by Zoom. The dates and times of these meetings are posted on the Green Mountain Care Board website. Our final report is due in mid-August. Mr. Chairman and committee, thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to entertain questions. Dr. Hemery and team, thank you very much for the very in-depth presentation and overview of the statewide changes needed to address the incredibly difficult challenges we have in our healthcare system. Um, I'm going to open it up to board members for any questions or comments they may have for Dr. Hamry or Ms. Sutherland. Nobody wants to go first. <laughs> uh, Chair Foster, I'm happy to go first if you'd like. Okay. Sure, please. Um, so first of all, a, a huge thank you to Elena and Marissa for kicking this off and Dr. Hamry and your team. Um, I, you know, I come away from this presentation, I feeling like your collective comments were indeed sobering. Um, and in my mind, this Act 167 community engagement work is, is probably the most important work that the Green Mountain Care Board has undertaken since I've been on the board anyway. Um, I don't have questions uh, at the moment, but I, I thought I would just reiterate some of the key motivators to support this critical work and, and uh, concepts that uh, resonated with me. Um, you know, going back to 2018, the Green Mountain Care Board has been concerned about the troubling trajectory of our hospitals. Uh, many of our hospitals started posting year after year of operating losses. And at that time, I think as Elena mentioned, we requested these hospital sustainability plans um, from those struggling hospitals. And then COVID hit and that work was postponed. In the interim, we hired some consultants to do some preliminary work on identifying paths to sustainability for our hospitals, analyzing cost coverage, trying to figure out volumes and quality relationship, looking for efficiency opportunities. Um, and that work started the conversation that I believe led to this more comprehensive community engaged process that the legislature outlined in 167. So I guess one thing I just want to note is it's been a long road. Um, and here we are six years later and and that situation has only worsened, right? Those the fiscal year 23 operating margins that uh, were posted earlier on the slides should be eye-opening, a giant red flag for all of us, especially given the commercial rate increases that the board has allowed in the past few years. So, you know, something's not working. I think that's clear. The status quo is not working. And as you pointed out, Dr. Hamery and Elena and Marissa, we've got a situation where Vermont's working age population is shrinking, our, pop our proportion over 65 is growing, 
that means our healthcare needs are expanding, but our ability to finance those needs is shrinking. That's our sustainability problem. Medicare and Medicaid have not been keeping pace with inflation. Employers and households can't continue to afford these double digit, you know, hospital price increases year after year. And unfortunately, the hard reality is that hospitals are going to be less and less able to cover these revenue gaps, net revenue gaps with commercial rate increases. Um, our Vermonters can't afford higher insurance premiums, and there's actually fewer and fewer commercially insured people. So, Dr. Hemery, I, I want to say first that I agree with you that we need to look very seriously at structural change. We can't be tweaking at the margin anymore. I think we've been trying to tweak at the margin for years, and I think that we need some structural change, but that needs to be thoughtfully planned. And I think the goal here is to do that thoughtful planning, that optimal design in a way that avoids some of those sudden hospital closures um, and disruptions of service lines that are plaguing rural communities across the country, right? So I think if, you know, we need action and inaction is gonna leave our communities vulnerable to market forces and the prevailing headwinds that are coming our way regardless, right? They're coming our way, demographic challenges, expense challenges. So I think this work that Dr. Hamry and his team are doing for the state, this data-driven community-engaged analysis is pretty unique. As far as I know, and maybe Dr. Hamry, you can share with us if you know otherwise, but I can't think of any other state that's undertaking such a comprehensive, community-engaged, proactive approach to trying to figure out the best way to deliver oh. healthcare in the state in the state. And so, you know, I, don't, I can't imagine other states are doing this kind of analysis, looking at demographic trends, looking at expense growth trends, and trying to envision a delivery system that both meets community needs and tries to protect against the headwinds coming our way. And so today's state level recommendations are a really helpful start and, um, you know, give us some state level 40,000 foot uh, recommendations. And I think they're critical as a starting point, and I look forward hoping that we can continue the conversation about their feasibility, their impact, thinking about weighing the costs of action against the costs of inaction. Um, and I look forward to, you know, you, I know you're coming back in a few weeks to give us more hospital level, HSA level uh, recommendations, thoughts. And I, and I just want to say, I think those conversations may be hard when you go out to the community. Some of those conversations may be hard. Um, I hope that people take them seriously. I hope that people realize that the status quo is not working. Uh, our current system is not affordable and it's not going to get better unless we do change. In some cases, we have volumes of care that are not high enough to support cost effectiveness or to ensure high quality. We need to look at that. So I guess in my mind, I'll stop talking, but in my mind, um, this is the start, a critical step in what I think of as a probably a longer term solution seeking conversation that has to involve communities, it has to involve healthcare leaders, it has to involve legislators and state agencies. And I'm just really grateful to you for all of your work, the countless listening sessions. Every time that I talk to you, Dr. Hamery, it seemed like you had talked to 500 other people in the interim. So I know you have really done incredible outreach to try and come up with a solution for Vermonters. And I just appreciate that. And I look forward to, to hearing more. So thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, I'm not aware of any other states doing this. I think this is a, another evidence of Vermont's leadership in trying to address proactively a number of problems and uh, certainly agree that uh, a number of conversations and uh, decisions need to follow. Uh, you will have noted all uh, the listeners that there is not a single silver bullet here. There are multiple problems that need to be addressed in different ways. There is a high degree of linkage between some of these. And so those need to be considered and are partially responsible for the conceptual outline of a timeline and dependencies. Um. I was just going to jump in with a few things. I mean, I, Jess, I really appreciate all your your comments about the work that that's been, you know, that that Bruce has worked on and the and the team at the care board and 
AHS and throughout the state. So I just want to say, first of all, a big appreciation for, for the effort, which has been a massive effort. Uh, again, I've talked with you a few times, and every time I talk with you, it seems as if you've had an incredible number of conversations. And then also the, the process that all the number of uh, meetings that I attended, hospital-based meetings, continue, uh, community-based meetings were impressive. I know that you did 10 times more. Um, and the conversations at those meetings were incredibly helpful in understanding the, the needs in the community. Um, I, I have, I think, prior to this report, but I think this report really is, I would use the word sobering as well, um, highlights concerns of patient access and hospital sustainability and healthcare system sustainability. And, and, and I think, I, I think um, the short-term concern for me has increased substantially through this work, understanding this work, as well as the medium and long-term. And so I, I agree with Jess's assessment that this work really needs to jumpstart rapidly some pretty challenging conversations about how to move forward because none of the solutions um, uh, many of the solutions actually that you outline for community-based services and whatnot are, 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 I think, very attractive, but I think the financial impacts of, of or the financial cost of all this is going to be challenging to figure out. And I think I, I appreciate the work and, uh, and that. I, I do have one question for you, and that is related to our Vermont's efforts in considering global budgets in the AHEAD model and how you would think about the, the work that you've done and your view of the system in Vermont and what's needed for transformation, how that would interact or dovetail or work or, or maybe not work with a global payment model, especially the, the AHEAD model. And just curious if you had thoughts on that. I think not totally formed at the moment. Uh, we're in discussions, as you know, continuing with the hospitals. There are certainly some attractive aspects. There are notable uh, approaches in there to equity, to improving uh, primary care services, um, but the impacts of those on the sustainability of the hospitals um, over the uh, near term and the long term, I think, are yet to be worked out well. And so I, I think for me, it's a, it's time to it not, it, I have to reserve some judgment on this, but uh, it has certainly positive features. It also uh, has some potential negatives that I know are under discussion and uh, consideration. Thanks for that. Go ahead and jump in unless you were about to, Owen. Did you? No, no, no. Go ahead. Great, thanks. Uh, I'll just echo what everyone else has said about the thank yous. It's obviously a lot of work has gone into the efforts to date. Um, and this isn't for today, but one thing I would be interested in is um, thoughts about prioritization of the recommendations. Um, there's a lot there, and particularly with any sort of legislative uh component even some even small changes can be a mammoth amount of work and resource intensive so uh, just be interested in terms of priorities so that uh, everyone can sort of think through what's low-hanging fruit what's a harder political lift um and how do you really make sure that you put your efforts in the right area if your resources are limited but thanks Thank you. Wonderful question. Um, and uh, if I wasn't clear enough, housing and what it takes to get that done. Uh, the second issue after that is licensure and how it happens and are there ways to get people in here. And, and as I noted, uh, a number of the licensing boards and state agencies have taken some action on that. But additional things need to be done directed at uh, trained people from out of the country. I noted the one physician 
Uh, I, I know another well-trained pharmacist uh, from Africa who works as a security guard. And with some, over, you know, with some proctoring, a period of uh, examination, fluency in English, that sort of thing, uh, there's no reason that those people could not be significant additions to the workforce if they can find a place to live. Thanks. I'll just uh, quickly join my colleagues in thanking you, Dr. Harmley, and your um, staff and colleagues, and our staff that's been working so closely with you for so long now. Um, I think you've done a terrific job helping to raise the awareness of the issues facing our state, um, the, the people who live there who need health care, and the providers who are delivering it. Um, and I thank you for helping focus us, all of us, on addressing these things that need to be addressed so urgently. So thank you. Um, we have AHS here. I, I'm going to turn to them in a second. Um, I, thank you very much, everyone, for your work. You know, when I got on the board, I had a sense that sort of these large commercial rate increases were um, a blip, or maybe I was just sort of hopeful that you all had taken care of that before I got on the board, and then we're going to be in nice, easy, smooth waters. Um, and as I've been here for 16 months or so, I've recognized that perhaps that was naive, and these double-digit rate increases don't look as though they are abating anytime soon. And if we look back at what member Holmes spoke about, um, where really this was sort of on the horizon in 2018, 2019, and we haven't made the change and here we are. And those double digit commercial rate increases are not going away so far as we can tell. I worry about those demographic changes that you spoke about, the far, uh, the significantly increasing elderly population, the removal of the workforce and the removal of the, um, people on commercial insurance, which is such a lifeline for so many of our providers in the state, that this problem will accelerate if we ignore again the problems that we have. And I fear that we'll do so to great uh, problems and, and devastation to our healthcare system. So I, I worry about that. I think it's normal to resist change, to not want to change. It's upsetting. This is upsetting. This whole presentation was frankly upsetting on many levels. Um, but I worry if we ignore it, we're going to be in a far worse place um, than if we take significant and important action. So I appreciate, one, the, the board and AHS and the legislature and the governor for signing 167 into law um, long before we arrived, I, before I was here. Because if we hadn't done that, imagine where we'd be. And that would be a very, very uh, risky place to our healthcare system. So fortunately, people have taken bold action to start addressing this, and now we're here to do so. So thank you very much for playing that important role, Dr. Hamry, and informing us and helping guide us. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it to uh, AHS if they're here, if they have any comments or, or questions that they want to make. Sure. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, for those that don't know me, my name is Monica Ogilvie. I'm the Medicaid Director at the Agency of Human Services. And I have had um, the privilege of serving on the steering committee uh, for this work and really want to thank Bruce and his team for his leadership um, and their support in pulling together and synthesizing an incredible amount of information, which, while as anyone, everyone here has noted, is really hard to hear, it's critically important if we're going to um, stabilize our healthcare system. And, you know, I, I, appreciate highlighting where we have been effective and where we do have traction um, in really uh, trying to scaffold our healthcare system. Uh, and that's largely in part to partnerships here and certainly to the support, uh, thanks to the support of the legislature uh, that allows us to do a lot of that incredibly valuable work. Um, I am choosing to remain in a hopeful space in that uh, the Agency of Human Services in particular is um, ready to rise to the challenge around the transformation work. And certainly that's not done in isolation. 
Uh, that will be done in partnership with many. And, you know, it's a space that we feel comfortable in and skilled in and, and have been successful before. Um, and so, you know, I'm eternally grateful for this work having been done. Chair Foster, I thought you summed it up really nice in that uh, not easy to look at, but certainly very necessary. It's like a look in the mirror and, and a moment of reckoning. So um, appreciate the opportunity to be a collaborating partner here. And I'm going to introduce myself. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Bowen, Jill Bowen. I'm the commissioner for Dale for the last six and a half weeks. Um, and it's really a pleasure to meet you and to hear, um, you know, this very, Bruce, we, we have met, um, but to hear uh, this in such a comprehensive way of uh, presenting the, the multiple challenges and from a systems perspective. and. Um, and that's been pretty clear to me since joining here, um, the way in which um, AHS looks at things in an integrated systems um, perspective. And um, I mean, I, as you were going through it, I was, uh, the, yes, yes, I've seen that, yep, yes, you know. So it's really clear. Um, and a lot of what you have raised are things that have been on these multiple agendas and efforts to really look at and um, move these forward. You know, if you were to ask me what's the number one challenge, I probably would have said housing, housing, and oh, housing. Um, so I, you know, just highlighting that as having so much, so many tentacles um, was really appreciated. Um, so from many, many sectors and from those of us who are newer here and for those of us who have obviously been here a while, there's so much um, effort and activity um, going on. And um, I just really have a sense that folks are incredibly passionately committed to making this system change. So thank you. Thank you for inviting us to hear this. This was very helpful. Hi there, this is Emily Haas, uh, Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. And um, I'll echo both what um, Monica and Dr. Bowen um, said, and I appreciate an opportunity to be here and, and hear the recommendations. Um, and of course, the things that are, are standing out around um, community investments and community mental health and substance use um, treatment and supports for our communities is number one on our um, mission um, as we look to collaborate with everyone here to develop a system where people can get care when and where uh, they want and need it. Um, so appreciate this opportunity. I don't have any questions right now, um, but I look forward to our continued partnership. So thank you. Uh, Chair Foster. May, may I yes. just say uh, to the AHS people, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure to chat with your folk and with m you, uh, because in fact, as you noted, you have proactively identified a lot of this and it is under, and I apologize if I was not sufficiently um, able to emphasize the responses that you're making. Uh, and, you know, you're doing great work. It, many things as you're trying to do, do require more resource. And uh, as, as I noted, as you work every day, unfortunately, some of this with the communities uh, just may require some rejiggering or, or, or whatever. But certainly the state uh, folk have been working heroically at a lot of these things for a long time. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Monica, Emily, and, and Jill, and Dr. Hamry. Um, we have a lot of um, guests here today, so we could have um, comment. I hope we do. Uh, so I'll take public comment via the raise the hand function if anyone has any thoughts or, or things they want to share with everyone. I'll take them in order of when they come, if I can figure that out. Um, Ham Davis? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. You, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, there's really two two things, two, uh, two separate parts to this today's presentation. One was the 
staff report and um, and which and, and then there was Dr. Hamry's report. Uh, they're they're, they're in, in one sense very different, but in another sense directly I think connected. I think the staff report is just doesn't catch doesn't seem real to me at all, and you've heard me say that before. We, the, what we have in the state of Vermont is not a system. We don't have a, a system, hospital system. We have two dramatically different hospital situation uh, systems, but both in terms of size, in terms of medical weight, but mainly in terms of business model. The small hospitals in the state operate basically from FIFA service. And the FIFA service and the uh, UVM Health Network basically on its own initiative runs on a salary basis. If you look at the, the uh, Wenberg small area variation analysis, especially starting if you start in 2018, which is the, the last pre full pre COVID uh, figures that we have, then the, uh, then the, uh, the uh, UVM network costs are a full third below the small house, smaller hospital costs in Vermont. Okay, and not only that, but their quality is vastly superior. Uh, so the question my so to me, what needs to happen to me first that I think first of all is that you've got to shift, you've got to consider these two things separately. So the second thing that needs to be done that has not been done and has been talked about and has basically which is a shift when you're considering costs and 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 volume and so forth, that you shift to capitation. Capitation is the way the system works. And the whole federal system starting in 2013 was aimed at that. That was what AA, that was what uh, CMMI wanted and that was the target and level four was full capitation. Um, we have gotten nowhere on that. The next thing is, it seems obvious to me is that we've got 600,000 people, a little bit more in Vermont. We've got 14 full service hospitals. I can't even imagine that anybody would, would, would would think that we really can manage that. We don't need that. We maximum we need is uh, oh four um, with a series of clinics that that can that can that can operate in smaller rural areas. Um, in any event, um, so so uh, so in any event, the, the yeah, last thing I want to say about that is that we're now looking at this ahead model. Okay, what we have is we've got. 10 years, 10 years where we were aiming, started in 2013, we started aiming at an all payer model. Okay, and what happened was that neither the feds, nor the Green Mountain Care Board, nor the local hospitals, nor anybody else, Blue Cross, would ever allow uh, capitation to work. Everybody and everybody and everybody knows that. If the if the and the main problem is not actually in Vermont, the main problem is at the federal level. If the feds had allowed that, if the feds had allowed Medicare, okay, to run on a, uh, on a capitated system in the same way that Vermont was able to make the Medicaid system work, then then we would be then then we would be in a vastly different place. Anyway. Shifting to Dr. Hamry, who I, I think who's you, Dr. Hamry's work has been available to us actually for some time, and it is extremely, to me anyways, impressive. Okay, but what he is basically saying is, here's what he's really, this, here's what he he's saying what he saying. He speaks for himself, but here's what I'm hearing. First was, there's no new, you completely, you need a complete rework of the system. Absolutely. And can anybody think that that's not true? The second thing is he's saying is there's no new money. If if even if you just in the most basic way, if you just listen to his report and you just start stuck a little dollar sign on every the, all the things that he said we needed to do, okay, we've got we have got this money that would add up to a number that is a total fantasy in Vermont. The Vermont legislature hasn't got any money. Has anybody been listening? The governor doesn't want to spend a dime, and he, he and the reason is he doesn't have it. Okay, so so you so I just think that um, um, I I just think that that you know the the reality is that the reality is that none of that's going. You Dr. Hamry can tell you you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the other thing. 
Not a chance. Real life? Seriously? No, the money's not there. Thank you. Uh, I guess just a quick comment. Uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, note that I said reallocation of existing resources. Okay, so this is doing things differently with the same dollars. I did say some startup money may be required, right, but yeah. you're you're right. There's no printing press. It's going to have to be a redirection of the way things go. But re, what redirection means in Vermont? Okay, because we've been look, we've been actually fighting this battle since 1973. Okay, we've been trying to figure this out, and here's what the 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 reality is: the the I agree with you. The actual money is totally there, but where if you ask where it's going and how you would get it back, what it is doing is it's you've got you've got four, fourteen hospitals, okay, all of them who think that they can't keep their doors open if they don't do stuff that's way too complicated for them. And the minute you start trying to figure out, you, you just wait until you sell, tell some uh, cr critical access hospital, eight of them. You, we have eight of them in Vermont, which is about a tenth the area of Geisinger, okay, where you had one. Okay, the reality is, the reality is every dime that you need, okay, is already there, okay. But in order to get it, you have to take it away from... People are getting big salaries to run 25 bed hospitals and people who are doing all kinds of stuff that they shouldn't do, you know, orthopedic stuff. That's they, they these people, the people are actually doing that. They if you think they're going to they're going to give that up without a huge battle in the legislature, you're kind of crazy. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. Um, Tom Darenthal. Um, Mr. Darenthal, I see your hands up. You might be muted if you're speaking. I think you were next. We can come back. Um, Ms. Gutwin. Thanks. Uh, good presentation. Good discussion. I am a voice for the independent community provider group. I'm a physical therapist with three uh, major locations, uh, physical therapy. And um, what I feel is kind of lacking in the discussion is this, this very important group of people. When I heard that there's a 12 month wait time for eye, eye surgery, I was thinking about we have two other places to go for eye surgery. Um, and I wondered if that was included as far as accessibility and price, the eye surgery center and the Green Mountain um, Surgical Center. Both these places, um, I feel, have better accessibility at a lower cost. And there's value to exploring how they do it. And maybe instead of making the, uh, the most expensive business, uh, increase their volume. I don't, I don't see how that's going to help the hospital or or, or payers of health care. I think um, we ought to learn more about what else is out there in the healthcare system and how that might actually contribute to the sustainability of the hospitals that we definitely need. And I am a supporter of community hospitals and, and uh, have had orthopedic surgery at Copley far sooner at what I felt was a more reputable place. As a physical therapist, that says a lot. Um, uh, two other things. Yes, we have an increased aging population. Vermont actually is fourth in the nation for the healthiest of the aging population. So we do have that going for us. Um, but it, it shows that preventative measures are even more important, right? If we can prevent a person from falling, they don't go to the ED, they don't have surgery, they don't end up in a hospital bed. 
And uh, physical therapists are known for decreasing healthcare costs by reducing fall injuries and other injuries, um, reducing surgeries, um, working with chronic care by making bodies more able to be active and healthy. So I don't hear that. I haven't heard that yet, how physical therapists can play a part in trying to make our healthcare system more affordable. And lastly, um, well, I actually already touched on it. I just, you know, I, I, I saw that uh, increasing volume would reduce cost or contain cost. I don't see how that could possibly happen if we have it all going to the most expensive, like we shouldn't all have to go to a large institution to get what can be done in a community that's local and a lower cost. So if anything, we should see a decreased volume in what care doesn't need to be done in a critical care setting and encourage more use of independent providers in the community. And I'm a strong supporter of helping increase the scope of practice where we can to free up our healthcare um, higher level providers to see um, more patients. Um, primary care offices aren't the preventative source, they're the hub. They don't do the actual preventative care there. They measure and then they refer out to mental health, physical therapy, MRI. In other words, we have to remember when we are funding primary care that that's only the first step to getting to the care um, when I go to the primary care doctor's office, I don't do any primary care there. I find out what the doctor is giving me um, to do elsewhere or go to the drugstore. So it's important. Independent providers in the community should be a part of this discussion of sustainability of hospitals and the healthcare system. Thanks. Well, thank you for those comments. I, I would just say two things. One, the engagement of all the providers, including the independent community folks and physical therapy and psychologists and others, it will be part of, has been part of these conversations, will be part of the planning for redesigning the system. And the other major point is I think you missed what I said about doing community things in the community but being able to perhaps group those so that you could hire an adequate number of physicians and by doing enough, do them more efficiently and provide better access. The intent is not to keep moving stuff to UVM and Dartmouth and Springfield, Missouri and Albany, but thank you for the comments. Ms. Ridson. Hi there. Can you can you hear me? You can. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. Good. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, certainly sobering, even for those of us who uh, understand the challenges that are going on. Uh, one thing that I don't hear mentioned that I, I don't think we can really bury our head about is just the misaligned incentives that exist in the broader system. Um, such as the medical loss ratio that basically incents health plans to spend as much on premiums as they can. Um, the pharmacy benefit managers who, you know, will put um, brand name drugs on the formularies when a generic exists because they get money for doing that. Um, so there's a lot of money in the system. And I, I realize we're in a capitalistic system, but it's crazy what some of the margins are that some of these entities make. And I know that's a broader federal situation, but there m must be some things that Vermont can do to help drive change in these areas. Um, because I think until those incentives are more aligned for optimal patient care, which they are not now, um, things are unlikely to change the way we need them to change. Thank you. Yep. I, I'm for, fortunately, I think you're right about a lot of it being fe at a federal level, but.
And this is something that at the care board have been we've been talking about and thinking about a little bit more of like what are the challenges to the um, commercial rate payers and where are they coming from? And we'll be in rate review pretty soon. But if you think of what goes into a commercial rate, there's many, many factors and the state's control over them is somewhat limited, right? So you do have hospital rate increases, you have non-hospital rate increases, you have just simple utilization that how often people go to the doctor and which doctors they select. You have how sick the patients are. So if the patients are sicker, those commercial rates go up a lot. You have pharmaceutical costs. You have how many pharmaceuticals you're buying. You have so many different components, insurance companies, whatever you know the pieces of that may be. So in terms of like what the care board regulates or AHS can work on or address, some of them are just not things immediately within the state's control or, or ambit. And certainly this project is really focused on um, one piece, but I think we should all recognize that it is only one piece and there's many others that go to our affordability challenges. Um, Mr. Darenthal, you look like you're back. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Okay, um, hi. Um, I am not a healthcare guy per se, at least not professionally, but I do appreciate, uh, Dr. Harmony, that you stepped back and really took a systems view of how this works, especially with regard to housing, and would hope that the uh, Green Mountain Care Board would be able to get some housing people to listen to the recording of your presentation. I think that would really uh, help move the needle. Um, and I have a, do have a quick question, uh, but anyhow, thanks. Uh, I wanted to make sure I thank you. Um, but I have a question and that's, you didn't mention uh, ACOs much. Um, now I had to step out for a second uh, in the middle of your, your talk, but I don't recall you saying much about that. Is there, is there a role for them or um, how should that be handled? Well, thank no, thank you for the question. No, I I really didn't go into financing, uh, and you're right about that. Uh, I did comment on one of the slides. Some of these structural changes are really needed to um, enable either an ACO or a global payment mechanism or whatever to succeed. And so I I did in a prior life a uh, set up one of the early ACOs. And the the real keys to that are number one, timely information. So you know you can identify the patients that and people who need better control of diabetes or whatever. And then secondly, a way to get that care to them, which really means primary care access. And associated with that, of course, you have the multiple social issues that either make it difficult or impossible for people to uh, take care of themselves and, and receive care. So I really didn't spend a lot of time on um, all, all the variations that you could go into in financing, but rather really focused on how and where and and uh, we deliver healthcare in Vermont, or you deliver healthcare in Vermont, and what some of those changes are that would be needed to enable whatever a change payment system would look like, because the underpinnings are really the same. Does that help? Yep. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the comment and question and participating, uh, Mr. Darenthal. Uh, Susan Aronoff? Uh, we'll come back to you, Ms. Aronoff. Um, uh, Joe Wooden. Yes, hi. Uh, I just wanted to make a couple comments. I think Bruce has done a really nice job. A lot of interviews, a lot of discussion. I couldn't do what he does. I really appreciate that he's listened to a lot of people, collected a lot of data, and I know at Copley, We've had some really fruitful discussions. He has asked us to really look at, <clears throat> we're known for our orthopedic work. Of course, we, we do a tremendous amount of it, and I think we're quite good at it. 
and it spills over to some areas. However, he, he's very discerning and has asked us to look at stuff and we've had private conversations and I think he's asking a lot of people to look at, you know, what service are you doing? Does it make sense? You know, can you afford to do that? So I just wanted to tip my hat off and say, thank you, Bruce. You've been sticking with that. You've done it in a very professional, nice way. And I think if we just let this sit and we don't have those discussions, a little bit of shame on us because that is a that is a bit of a problem. There is no more money. I agree with that. We're going to have to figure out how to allocate it or how to best spend that. Um, I'm a big advocate of uh, developing more commercial viability in Vermont because they pay taxes. And it'd be great if we could do that, but I know that's not the focus of this group. Uh, I know that I have a piece of paper here from, you can't read that. Oh, that's convenient. Um, just from today about, you know, cost and payments. And so we're working with an insurance company and, you know, they'd like to lower our rates and our commercial rates. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, we looked at an emergency department visit. Um, we get paid uh, $376 for a level three. State average is 635 and they pay one hospital 1,178. We went through these examples with the insurance companies, actually what they pay us, not just the, the prices that are listed, but ultimately what we get paid. And I think we're gonna have to keep having those discussions because the variability, people could say, oh, commercial doesn't matter, my goodness. Commercial matters to all of us, so I know they they carry an inordinate burden, and we we wish we could alleviate that, but we don't have a tax base to increase Medicaid significantly, and Medicare is as it is. Medicare is Medicare, but we should. I I think uh, you know all of this is going to have us really thinking fundamentally about the systems. What are we doing? What shouldn't we be doing? How to maybe force some coordination that's not there that we should be looking at for the greater good of the patient, shifting money away from hospitals to preventative care that was uh, talked about by Sharon and others. So, again, I really appreciate all the effort. It's a lot of work. And uh, I guess now, when it's all said and done, is when we start to all do the work. <laughs> so, just be prepared for that. But that's, that's all for my comments. All right. See you later. Uh, thank you for attending, Mr. Wooden, and um, being here. And I've been told a couple of times to make sure I, re I recognize people and where they're from, if they're from uh, entities that are involved. And, and Mr. Wooden is the CEO of Copley, and he referred to meetings that um, Oliver Wyman and Bruce and his team and Elizabeth have been having with hospital leaders and, and boards um, that are private meetings. I understand that they're uh, some back and forth on on options and, and thoughts about ways to look at the situation that various hospitals have. And then there'll be a little bit of uh, process and sort of getting the feedback and then we'll have the community engagement process starting July 8th or 9th or whatever the date was that was shown earlier. Um, Mr. Del Treco, the CEO of VAS, the Vermont Association of Hospitals and Health Systems. Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me, uh, Chair Foster? Yes. Great, great. So, um, first of all, as always, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you and, and provide public comment. Um, through this process, I've had the opportunity to look at some information, uh, have conversations with my uh, board uh, and uh, Bruce and his team. Um, so, so thank you for that uh, time and opportunity. Um, I mentioned on more than one occasion when VAS evaluates new policies or new ideas, we look through the lens of uh, three or four principles here. Um, we look at equitable and high, uh, high quality access to care. We look at how things are going to stabilize our hospitals. We look at how things are going to promote a strong um, care and ecosystem. We look at predictability. There are so many contradictions in this work we talked about today. Um, reduce reduce services, uh, in, increase uh, transportation, increase long-term care, um, improve access, potentially change service lines. I'm not sure where they start and begin, and I think the flowchart that Bruce uh, presented uh, uh, depicts some of the uh, challenge. Um, so there are many pressing issues that face our delivery system, and many of the discussions we talked about today um, address that. We've talked the Greenmont Care Board has addressed it. Hospitals have talked about it. The provider community has been discussing many of these things for multiple years. 
um, transportation, mental health, substance, substance use disorder, access to long-term care, skilled nursing, home health services are all challenges that are acknowledged and are real issues. I want to thank my colleagues at AHS for looking at these and, and making investments. I think we need to continue to do uh, data-driven work um, and, and acknowledge these and under, understand where the interdependencies are on any and all recommendations. Um, on top of the delivery system challenges, for example, we have increased homelessness. That those issues have uh, more and more patients using uh, our emergency departments as places of last resort. I think Bruce mentioned on more than one occasion that we are often seen as a place of last resort. That's not only for outpatient activity, but it's for inpatient activity as well. Very challenging to our delivery system and, and frankly, uh, a very exp expensive place to deliver care. Um, I truly think when these issues are overlaid with demographics, the fact that our population is older, aging faster, and the need for more services is imperative that we understand the financial implications of how any and all of these recommendations will impact our delivery system. A primary tenant of, of how I think about uh, our, who we are and how rural we are is how do we keep care local and do it effectively. Um, so as recommendations are, are evaluated, we need to identify the implementation costs. Um, I, I'm not sure if we can afford uh, changes. I don't know how we shift monies around um, and, and these need to be weighed carefully and we must include a pathway for this implementation. Our number one priority must be to do no harm to our already vulnerable communities. Affordability is critical, a critical issue and I know the board talks about it a lot. Um, and there are some reasons why some of these pressures exist. There are pharmaceutical pressures, there are workforce pressures, and we have unfavorable pay governmental payer mix. We just have terrible payer mix, 60 plus percent Medicare and Medicaid. And when that doesn't keep pace, we know that puts pressure on costs. Um, proposals that drive or create a second tier delivery system or could put, create a second tier delivery system or affect patient safety and reduce access should be non-starters for all of us. I know Dr. Hamry spoke briefly about taxation and we don't have a printing machine, but it's super important that we address that we have an economic crisis and we cannot just drive the delivery system uh, in different ways. Um, because Bruce, I, you know, if, if some of these pr present uh, recommendations create harm, um, we would invite you to live in those communities. <laughs> Um, I say that with a, with humor, but but I but I think we all need to uh, look at what those non-starter issues should be and understand them completely. Um, I'm I'm really proud of our not-for-profit hospitals. Um, we continue to evolve, and we have evolved, and it's important to acknowledge that we've embraced value-based care, and that's come at a cost. We now have eight critical access hospitals where they, they were once 100 bed facilities. That didn't happen overnight, but that is real change. Well over 50% of our care is delivered on an outpatient, outpatient basis, very significant. We've re reduced our re revenue growth rates from pre-GMCB levels from eight to 9% to about four and a half percent. And and I And I'd love to explore this a little bit more, Chair Foster, but our eight year approved weighted average increase is 4.4%. There's only been one double digit year uh, last year. Um, so, and, and I, I believe it's one, but I'd have to check my facts on that. But our, our total weighted average increase for eight years is 4.4%. This alone has saved our delivery system millions of dollars. So this is incredibly important work. I can't thank Bruce, the Greenmont Care Board enough um, but we can't compromise patient safety, our workforce, and and the local care that's provided in our communities. And I and I do worry that if any of this is poorly communicated in any way, um, it would cause significant challenges to our workforce. And I think we all need to um, understand the those implications. Uh, and I'll just would close by saying, as always, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. I'll be paying close attention to the uh, HSA recommendations and um, I'm happy to answer any any questions that anybody might have. Thank you. Uh, 
If I may, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to thank Mr. Del Treco and his staff for the enormously important help they've given and the hospitals to this process. And in particular, uh, you know, some, some real help in trying to quantitate the needs of hospitals and communities for other ways to deliver care in other sites. So uh, thank you for your comments, but also thank you and your staff very much for uh, your work on this process as well. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Hammer. It's it's very, very important work and we and we we have to get it right for Vermonters. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Ms. Aronoff, you did have your hand raised and then I don't see it anymore. Um can you hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, the board and Dr. Hicks for this really thoughtful process, especially for making to include people with disabilities and needs. I'm not sure it's coming through, Chair Foster and Susan. I I can't quite hear. I see shaking heads. Oh. Okay. I'll be really loud and really brief. It would be really great if the agency of human services recommended wage increases for the agencies that provide community-based services for people with disabilities depend on every year we have to fight at the legislature to increase the wages. So that's why our workforce is suffering. That's why our service system is crumbling. That's why parents age and older can't get services in adult Take care of them. So please, Agency of Human Services, please fund the services. Please recommend wage increases for all the Medicaid services. So, Ms. Aronoff, a little in and out. Um, I'll try and summarize because I think I caught most of it, but um, I think your comment was largely um, directed at wages for those serving the disability community and a request for um, appropriate wages or wage increases. Um, if you want, you can just send us a public comment uh, since we weren't able to capture it and we can just put it um, on our website. Um, but thank you for... Uh, any other public comment? Okay, great. Um, Dr. Hamry and, and team, thank you all very, very much. And thank you to our partners at AHS for attending and the hospital leadership and VAS for um, participating today and, and hearing these important statewide recommendations and to the legislators that I, I noticed here and the independent providers as well that came. So thank you everyone very, very much. And is there any old or new business for the board? Okay, I will move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. 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 Thank you. All right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And we're adjourned. <laughs>